First of all, I want to say something about the modern crisis, then something about existentialism and the modern crisis, and then something about Sartre and the crisis in morality. Finally, there will be a conclusion. Now, to begin with the modern crisis, I have examined a crisis in religion and philosophy, about which I want to be very brief at this time, and I still have to examine what I take to be a crisis in morality. And in all three instances, there is one common factor which consists in the enormous rise of the natural sciences and in their wake of the social sciences too. I do believe that this great development of the sciences has an enormous amount to do with what I have called the modern crisis. This does not mean to anticipate that I think that this development of the sciences is regrettable. That doesn't follow at all. I just see a connection there. Now, the way that I conceive of the modern crisis in religion, as many of you by now know, is that science has threatened traditional naive beliefs, that science has made it impossible for large masses of thoughtful, educated, intelligent people to hold the same kind of beliefs in the same way in which their parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and generations for hundreds of years have held them, and has led to a widespread abandonment of these beliefs or to an attempt at reinterpretation and in the wake of this reinterpretation, there is the very serious question in many instances, what meaning remains to these beliefs. I have further tried to point out in the first lecture that morally, this ties in with tonight's problem, that morally there has come to be a very open, a frequently, frankly avowed, process of selection where people admit that they don't accept all the moral commandments of their religion, but that they pick out some while rejecting others as, of course, primitive or, of course, to be accounted for in historical terms or perhaps in psychological terms. And in the wake of this election, the question arises whether then the morality isn't really based on reason, on experience, on conscience, and whether bringing in religion or God afterwards as a sanction is not merely redundant. There's the further problem I have suggested in the first lecture, that organized religion has always posed for true religion, a point that Kierkegaard made at particular length and with great emphasis, but a point that one could easily trace back through the history of religion at the very least as far as the biblical prophets. And there's also an inverse proportion of the quantity of believers and the quality of believers, a point again abundantly made in the Hebrew scriptures that in times in which everybody flocks to the temple, religion is likely to become something shallow and superficial, while it is perhaps only the remnant, perhaps only the small number that has religion in a deeper sense. The crisis in philosophy, I have suggested last week, consists in the fact that emulation of the natural sciences leads more and more and more English-speaking philosophers to reject almost all, not quite all, but almost all of traditional philosophy. One begins to wonder whether traditional philosophic tenets are not perhaps just as untenable as traditional religious beliefs, some of them seem to have to be accounted for, again, either in psychological or more often in historical terms as belonging to a certain era, but many of them no longer seem at all acceptable. This, I think, is a crisis, even if some people would call it by another name, the large body of philosophy that has come down to us has suddenly become questionable. People wonder whether what has been called philosophy hitherto is worth 
preserving. And what some of them are now doing is something quite different from what was done traditionally, and as far as English-speaking philosophers are concerned, tends on the whole to be very academic and to be of relatively little interest to the very large number, to the steadily growing number of intelligent and concerned laymen, laymen in the sense that they are not professional philosophers. There's further the factor that in philosophy too, organization plays some part, that more and more philosophers find themselves allied with universities, in fact practically all of them, there are hardly any philosophers left who do not have some university position, and being in the academies, they tend to be more academic. There's a rising number of philosophic journals which are read by fellow craftsmen, so one tends to write for each other, for other professional philosophers, for fellow technicians, instead of dealing with cosmic questions, with religious questions, with the larger moral questions. You might say, even so, where is the crisis? And perhaps I have to add only one thing at this particular point, and that is what creates such a crisis here is that for all the emulation of the sciences so far, except possibly in such narrow fields as probability theory or something of that sort, certainly philosophers, for all their academic manners, haven't come up with any results comparable to those of the natural sciences. And where is the crisis in morality? The crisis in morality, I think, parallels the crises that I have tried to analyze in religion and in philosophy. Here, too, it is very largely due to the development of science. And again, I'm not at all critical of science for this. I don't hold it against science. On the contrary, I uh, heartily appreciate the, on the whole, anti-authoritarian attitudes that science breeds. In science, there are no authorities. In science, you can always be challenged for the evidence. You can't just say a great man said. You can't cite Newton as an authority. You have to see whether things stand up. Moreover, you have to consider alternative hypotheses. Sometimes there is a seemingly very good hypothesis, but you still have to ask, aren't there some other hypotheses that are just as good? And perhaps one of these alternatives is even more elegant than the one you already have. In this way, traditional morality is undermined. Once one gets into the habit of asking what's the evidence for what is being said, and aren't there any alternatives, you have an attitude that no longer acquiesces in traditional morality. Traditional morality need not even be exactly the same for everybody. It may differ slightly in some respects, depending on ethnic or on religious background. But what moralities in general have in common, traditional moralities, is that they have something authoritarian to them, that they are originally taught to a child as what's what. The parent knows, the teacher knows, the rabbi, priest, or minister knows, and the child is supposed to accept what it is told. And when one gets into the mood of saying, well, what's the evidence for this, and aren't there perhaps alternatives, traditional morality is undermined. And the obvious result that this has led to can be summed up in one word, namely relativism, moral relativism, where people ask whether whatever morality they have been brought up on isn't possibly just one morality among a large number of moralities, and is there really any reason, they ask, for preferring one to the others. The social sciences have developed further, and again, they have had a very critical influence on morality. Here, perhaps, the best single example would be the kind of thing uh, that is exemplified by the Kinsey reports by gathering statistics, by telling people what percentage of the population does certain things people's 
conscience becomes a little less stern, they have the feeling that there is some safety at any rate in numbers, that if so many people do such things, they can't be quite so bad. Of course, uh, it would be foolish to suppose that science is the only factor in this crisis in morality. It obviously isn't. There are other factors. For instance, that there are such growing numbers of people, more people than ever before. Well, with a growing number of people, there's also a growing anonymity. There's a loosening of social bonds. There's mobility. More people move around. They move from the country to a city, from a small city to a very big city, from one big city to another city. And as a result of this, there is a loosening of social bonds. Nobody knows you. The neighbors no longer know you. And here, too, certain restrictions fall by the way. And there is necessarily, as a result of this, as there always, I think, has been in history, under comparable circumstances, a growing permissiveness. And all this that I have said so far, I don't mean to take sides. I don't mean to make any particular evaluation. I just want to explain what I mean by the crisis in morality. Perhaps it is uh, relevant and even crucially important to say something about the word crisis at this point. After all, a crisis is not necessarily anything bad anyway. What crisis means, literally, is a turning point, a crucial time. The Greek word krenein means to separate, and you might say that a crisis is the time which separates the men from the boys. It is somehow a decisive moment. Krenein means not only separate, but also decide. Crisis is the moment of decision, or to use a term that is used in a certain sport, it's the moment of truth. The moment when you sort of see what stands up and what doesn't stand up. It's in that spirit that I speak of crisis, not in a nostalgic way, not by way of suggesting, aren't we an unfortunate generation, that ours is a time of crisis, but I want to leave wide open whether every time isn't possibly a time of crisis, and whether if, in some respects, our crises are more acute than ever, I want to leave open whether that is a good or a bad thing. Now, one trouble with these lectures, I think, has been that in the last lecture, although I did speak of Nietzsche, I did not, on the whole, concentrate on existentialism, but I illustrated the crisis in philosophy very largely from English-speaking philosophy. And so I, after having in these general terms characterized the modern crisis, want next to deal with existentialism and the modern crisis. And here, at least in the beginning, I can again fall back on some points previously made. I'll first deal very briefly with the two men to whom I have already devoted a lecture apiece, namely Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. One thing that they have in common, in spite of the many things that very obviously they don't have in common, is that both of them were aware of the kind of crisis that I have tried to picture for you. I don't at all go along with the attempt made by some people of kind of throwing Kierkegaard and Nietzsche together as if all their many differences were unimportant. It does seem to me that very obviously the differences are in reality more important than the things that they have in common. They're more important because they differed on the things that mattered most to them. Nothing mattered more to Kierkegaard than how one might become a true Christian, and probably few things mattered more to Nietzsche than his criticism of Christianity, not just of Christendom, but of Christianity. But for all that, they do have some things in common, and one thing they have in common is that in the middle of the 19th century, or one man in the middle and one man a little later, still in the 19th century, they foresaw a crisis that many people even today are not fully aware of. 
And one thing further that both Kierkegaard and Nietzsche recognized, and this was no mean feat in their time, was that this crisis was intimately related to the progress of science. They both recognized that. Kierkegaard drew the conclusion from this, and I dealt in detail with this in the first lecture, that science was a bad thing, that science was a dangerous thing, and that one ought to have the courage to be unscientific, that one ought to have the courage to believe what science considers absurd, that one ought to go against reason and against science. Nietzsche's attitude on the whole, I think, was in favor of science. This is one of the points on which I have tried in my work on Nietzsche to interpret him somewhat differently from the way many other people have interpreted him. I've tried to show in considerable detail that his attitude toward reason was on the whole affirmative, appreciative, and similarly also his attitude toward science. And there are abundant texts to bear this out. And in his criticism of Christianity, he comes back to this theme time and again, that Christianity has been anti-scientific, anti-rational. But although Nietzsche, in important respects, made common cause with science, he did not share as most of the thinkers of the later 19th century did, the vast optimism about science, as if now that we have science and science grows, it will solve all our problems and people will become more humane and better and everything will be fine. Nietzsche, while affirming science, realized that science did produce crises in religion, in philosophy, and in morality. Moreover, he did not agree with the English-speaking philosophers today who want to make of philosophy an academic specialty modeled on the sciences. Nietzsche did not believe in restricting philosophy to matters on which factual agreement can be obtained. In these respects, he was not at all in favor of emulating science. Here he saw some of the dangers of science. What he was in favor of, and this is a distinction worth making, and a distinction with which I definitely align myself, what he was in favor of was careful, critical thinking, and even experimental thinking to the extent of being willing to engage in thought experiments, to consider alternative views in morality, in theory of knowledge, wherever philosophers think, to weigh these against each other. There's actually one of Nietzsche's books that has the title Fröhliche Wissenschaft and subtitled Gaia Scienza, and in English should be called the Gay Science, although unfortunately it was translated, very misleadingly I think, as the Joyful Wisdom. What Nietzsche had in mind was gay science, and what he meant by science was this open-minded, critical, experimental spirit. So both Kierkegaard and Nietzsche understood the crisis, understood its connection with science, but took different views of science. Now, briefly, before I turn to Sartre, I want to go on from Kierkegaard and Nietzsche to a couple of existentialists whom I do not propose to discuss in any detail, but of whom at least I want to indicate briefly, as was suggested in the printed announcement of these lectures, how they fit into the picture, at least how I propose to fit them into this picture. There is first of all Martin Heidegger. The German philosopher, still living, now in his 70s, who is, by some people, considered the most profound existentialist philosopher. Now, how Heidegger reacts to the modern crisis can be, I think, not unfairly suggested by a sentence that I shall quote from him, and that incidentally is also quoted emphatically and apparently with approval in a recent very popular book on existentialism, where it is also singled out as very characteristic, although the author finds no fault with it. 
So it's not malice that dictates my picking this particular sentence. The sentence is, thinking does not begin until we learn that reason, though glorified for centuries, is the most stubborn adversary of thinking. This is what Heidegger says, thinking does not begin until we learn that reason, though glorified for centuries, is the most stubborn adversary of thinking. I think this is very interesting. In this respect, Heidegger, although widely characterized as an atheist, and he doesn't mind this characterization, he certainly is not a theist, I don't like these labels of theist and atheist particularly, but he is certainly avowedly not a theist, in this respect, Heidegger is much closer to Kierkegaard than are such people as, for example, Karl Jaspers and Paul Tillich, who make much more of their respect and admiration for Kierkegaard than Heidegger does. When Heidegger talks of Kierkegaard these days, it's by way of depreciation. He was not a philosopher, he was merely a religious thinker. Leaving out the merely, I agree that Kierkegaard was no philosopher, but a religious writer. He said so himself. But in this anti-scientific, anti-rational bias, this is interesting, I think, Heidegger, though not a Christian and not a theist, is really much closer to Kierkegaard than any number of other contemporary existentialists. Now, what remains if you have this animus against reason, if you recognize, as Heidegger too does, the connection between science and technology and the characteristic feats of the 20th century, if you recognize the connection between that, what is usually considered progress on the one hand, and the crisis in religion, philosophy, and morality on the other hand. Well, he draws the conclusion, we must therefore, in some sense, oppose scientific thinking. We must oppose reason. This raises the big question, well, how then is one as a philosopher going to think and write? And what I think almost necessarily has to happen is that a philosopher who adopts this attitude must relapse into a highly arbitrary way of thinking, which will either be associative thinking, just sort of moving from one sentiment to the next one that's associated, almost the way a Freudian patient on the couch does when engaging in free association, or doing something else which really isn't so different, namely, in order to avoid total anarchy and incoherence, to find some texts of which he can then offer exegesis. And in this way, Heidegger seeks his way back to the earliest philosophers, the pre-Socratic philosophers, some of whom wrote poetically, some of whom wrote aphoristically, and all of whom have one thing in common, and that is that we don't possess any of their works, but only scattered quotations, only fragments preserved in the writings of other people. I share with Heidegger an enormously high regard for some of these fragments, which are fascinating, which are worth studying, but I don't think it is an example of sound method to try to develop a philosophy by taking sentences out of context, usually there is no context, when there is one, Heidegger still takes them out of context, and then, and this is almost inevitable, reading his own ideas into them. This is not just my opinion, but even those followers of Heidegger, who greatly admire his earlier work, if they happen to be classical philologists as well, roundly repudiate his interpretations of Greek philosophers as philologically untenable. And people who know their Rilke realize that his Rilke interpretations are untenable, and people who know their Nietzsche realize that his Nietzsche interpretations are untenable. But this is not surprising. This is not just something that 
happens to happen, but if thinking does not begin until we learn that reason, though glorified for centuries, is the most stubborn adversary of thinking, if we deliberately overrule reason and scientific procedures in the sense of regard for evidence and impartiality, well then, how can the interpretations be sound? They might in places be enormously suggestive and exciting, but I never can persuade myself that it's very difficult to be suggestive and exciting if one doesn't care to be sound. I'll give you one example, which is both in print and which I also happen to hear in person. Heidegger gave a series of lectures at Freiburg in 1955-56 uh, on what he called Der Satz vom Grund, which seemed to mean the principle of reason, the principle of sufficient reason. And the turning point of the lectures was provided by a sentence which I will initially have to give in German, and I trust that some of you will understand it. He began to talk about the leap, one of Kierkegaard's conceptions, L-E-A-P, the jump, the leap. And he said, Der Sprung ist der Satz vom Grundsatz vom Grund in das Sagen des Seins. Which means something like, the leap is the jump from the basic principle of reason into saying something about being. But it all depends on punning. Namely, the word Satz, he suddenly pointed out, doesn't only mean sentence or principle, but can also mean in German, jump or leap, as when one says, Heidegger's own example, er ist mit einem Satz zur Tür hinaus, he is out of the door with one jump, and similarly, Grund can also mean ground, so that suddenly, from the principle of reason, we get to the jump from the ground. Now, this is the height of arbitrariness. It is suggestive, but it is terribly close, and for a philosopher, compromisingly close to Finnegan's wake. This makes it eminently suitable for study in graduate seminar seminars, where you want to discuss something that's difficult and puzzle it out, and something can perhaps be learned from it, but the important thing is that not only is the whole history of philosophy since the pre-Socratics rejected by Heidegger because it attempts to be rational and reasonable, but what we get instead is something that is in its nature completely arbitrary, unsound, and dangerous. That he might, for all that, have occasional insights is another matter. I personally happen to think that he has fewer of those than other existentialists. This may be a minority view, and I shall not try to argue it in detail here. I have dealt, I might say, with Heidegger in some detail, and for that matter also with Jaspers in some detail, in From Shakespeare to Existentialism, which was recently issued in paperback by Anchor Books, in chapters 15, 17, and 18. And there, too, is a chapter, it happens to be chapter 14, that deals in some detail with the relation of philosophy and poetry, which, of course, is crucial for doing justice to Heidegger, since what he wants to do is bring philosophy closer to poetry than to science. So I'll refer you here to my From Shakespeare to Existentialism and move on to a few passing remarks about Jaspers and Tillich before moving on to Sartre, with whom I want to deal in some detail. In Jaspers and also in Tillich, who are in many ways, I think, similar, you find attitudes that are avowedly and emphatically in favor of reason and in favor of science. They both, on the whole, lean over backwards not to share Kierkegaard's anti-scientific bias, but rather to welcome science. Where religion and science conflict, Tillich is likely to say that religion must be in the wrong, and similarly, Jaspers insists 
being himself a doctor of medicine who specialized later in psychiatry, that it is good training for a philosopher to master one of the sciences. It's interesting, as I have already mentioned, that both of them make so much more of Kierkegaard than Heidegger, that both of them are closer to Kierkegaard's religion, so I think very far indeed from sharing it, than Heidegger, but that nevertheless, in spite of that, in basic orientation, they really have terribly little in common with Kierkegaard. And I might say that although both of them are clearly more attractive personalities than Heidegger, that both of them clearly have a kind of personal integrity that many of us feel Heidegger, if he had it, ever lost during the Nazi period, that for all that, perhaps both Jaspers and Tillich are less radical for better or for worse, than Kierkegaard, and then Nietzsche, and then Heidegger, and then Sartre. They see some of the elements of the modern crisis. I am not sure that they go quite so much to the roots of it as I think Sartre does. And now, by way of making a transition to Sartre, I might say that here again I think I'm submitting to you a minority view. I think it is on the whole fashionable to say that Heidegger, particularly if one hasn't read him, is surely the profound Teutonic thinker, while Sartre is merely the journalist who popularizes all this. I don't agree with this at all. I esteem Sartre not only as a human being, but also quite emphatically as a writer and thinker much more highly than I do Heidegger. And Heide higher also than Jaspers, and so I have selected him for more detailed treatment, partly out of regard for him. I'm now ready, finally, to deal with Sartre and the crisis in morality. Very briefly, first of all, a very few data about the man. He was born in Paris in 1905 and suffered the same fate that Nietzsche suffered in one respect, he lost his father as a little boy. His father died, and then he was brought up by his mother in the maternal grandparents' house. And there's something interesting about this. His maternal grandfather is an Alsatian, or was an Alsatian, by the name of Schweitzer. And Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Schweitzer are cousins which I suppose few of you knew, and which I think is a rather piquant little detail. His mother remarried when little Jean-Paul Sartre was 11 and moved with a boy from the Alsace to La Rochelle, where he grew up. Then he absolved his military service, studied philosophy as a philosopher, as Heidegger had done earlier. He studied for a while with Edmund Husserl, the German-Jewish founder of the School of Phenomenology, was very profoundly impressed by Husserl and started out as a philosopher with a phenomenological orientation. He did some teaching before the war, and on the eve of the First World War, in 1938, published his first novel, available in paperback, Nausea, followed it up the following year in uh, 1939 with a collection of short stories, originally named in French Le Mur and in English The Wall, but then when it got to the paperback level, it was called Intimacy and had... <laughs> and had a variety of rather lurid covers, but seeing that there are five short stories, one of which is called The Wall and one of which is called Intimacy, I must say that having read the five, I think Intimacy is the more accurate title. In this case, uh, it does not promise too much. I don't think that the stories are in any sense 
pornographic. I don't know that it is not misleading when the cover quotes a British magazine that said leaves Lady Chatterley sleeping at the doorpost. <laughs> but they are very frank and forthright stories which I think have points to make and which I happen to think, again a minority view perhaps, are very excellent and very profound and very interesting stories. He also published, before the war broke out, several philosophic essays, mainly phenomenological. Then he published what might be, without hesitation, called his main works during the war, chiefly Lettere Linea, Being and Nothingness, translated in full into English by Hazel Barnes, and available in one big volume and very difficult to read in large parts, as well as a play that came out the same year, The Flies, Le Mouf, and uh, about the same time another play, No Exit, and then any number of further plays, of which perhaps the single most interesting is the one uh, Le Diable et le Bon Dieu, Lucifer and the Lord, or The Devil and the Good Lord, also published quite a bit of literary criticism. In 1946, a lecture to which I shall have to recur when I start in a moment talking about morality, which is called Existentialism is a Humanism. And then what is probably his most controversial work, a long book on a man who was, at the time that this book was written, simply considered vile and a criminal, but who is now widely considered party without ever belonging to it. He felt that if one was seriously against the status quo, that then one ought to make common cause with the one party, so it seemed to him that was serious about overthrowing existing society and changing it. He never seems to have been under any illusions that surely his own head would have been one of the first to roll if the communists should have taken over. I think he did show on this rather abominable bad judgment. I think that there was a certain obtuseness about it, but it is interesting that he never followed any strict party line, but remained, as one would expect of him, all along an eccentric individualist. After Budapest, he welcomed, I think, the opportunity of having some cause now over which he could openly dissociate himself from the Communist Party. He did it in an interview that was published in English in, I think, the first issue of the Evergreen Review. It's very interesting to read. I think it's, to my mind, a somewhat dismal performance, which, uh, again, although he now uh, is anti-communist, does not, to my mind, show any political penetration or particular good sense. I don't think that this is the most serious matter that one can say about a philosopher. I would cheerfully say that Plato did not mu have much political good sense either, and it remains an open question whether a philosopher who is politically not very perceptive might not possibly be very profound in other matters. Now, what is the core of Sartre's philosophy. At that point, clearly, one has to make a selection and people will differ about what is the core. I will suggest that perhaps the central idea of Sartre's philosophy is, and I will here, so far as possible, paraphrase him, that man is, in Sartre's fine phrase, condemned to be free. Man is condemned to be free. And the meaning of this comes out in Sartre's addition that man is constantly tempted to hide his freedom from himself and to live in bad faith. Call it bad faith or call it, as I have done in my little anthology of existentialism from Dostoevsky to Sartre, in which the wall is reprinted along with the lecture on existentialism as a humanism, and portrait of the anti-Semite, the section also on bad faith from Lettre Linea, and I dare don't call it bad faith, I call it self-deception. It's no great matter, it means, I think, much the same thing. Sartre's point is that man tries to deceive himself about his own freedom. 
he tries to deceive himself into thinking that he is not as free as in fact he is, perhaps even into thinking that he is not at all free. What man craves, Sartre thinks, is a different mode of being altogether from the human mode of being. Sartre suggests that there are two modes of being, the ones that he calls using phrases out of Hegel, out of the German philosopher Hegel, en soi and pour soi, the inner itself and the for itself. But we don't need this particular terminology. We can say the two kinds of being are the en soi, the being of things, and the pour soi, the human mode of being. And things, Sartre suggests, have a mode of being that is characterized, or so at least it seems to man, by a solidity that men do not have. In this connection, I personally think that Sartre engages in altogether too much jargon, in unnecessary verbiage, which is modeled after Hegel, and after Heidegger, sometimes also after Husserl, that's exceedingly academic in the worst tradition of academic philosophy, and that in places can, I think, hardly be construed and figured out. But for all that, I'm very far from saying that that's all there is to it. On the contrary, my whole point is that in this forbidding shell, there are what I consider some very profound insights. What man, Sartre thinks, wants is the solidity that characterizes the being of things. Man wants to exist all at once. He wants to be there all at once, like a rock, like a piece of stone that's impermeable. He wants to have that kind of an identity. And when you have a quiet moment, when you are, say, by yourself, and suddenly realize that you could also be quite different from the way you are. Let's say you happen to be giving a lecture, or you happen to be a professor, or you happen to be a doctor or a lawyer or a businessman or what have you, that you really aren't a doctor, a lawyer, a businessman, a professor, or giving a lecture in the same way in which a stone is hard, or in which water contains oxygen, but that it's up to you, up to a decision that you make, whether you remain that way. I could right now stop this lecture and walk out. I could right now resign my job. You could become quite different. You could give up the kind of career that you have had so far. You could suddenly decide that you will take the first ship on which you can get and go to Africa to do something or other, to work with Schweitzer, to make trouble in the Congo, any number of things. There are all these possibilities. No one can dress up some of these possibilities in a humorous way and just be entertaining about it. But when it strikes home, when you suddenly realize that there is something of a fake security about your present mode of life, that it could suddenly be changed altogether, that's rather frightening. It's much more comforting to think, as for me, I am such and such a person. As for me, I happen to be a lawyer. Well, that's me. Or as for me, for that matter, I happen to be an anti-Semite, and there you are, and now make of that what you want to. There isn't that frightening. This is the kind of person I am. Now, while we don't necessarily adopt such uh, aggressive views as Sartre's anti-Semite does, and as anti-Semites generally do, Sartre, I think, is suggesting that the anti-Semite that he sketches for us is merely characteristic of a common human tendency, that the way that the anti-Semite lives in bad faith is only an extreme example of a way in which most of us decline the full and frightening measure of their responsibility and somehow seek security in a spurious sort of solidity. I think that there are few, if 
any people in the whole of literature and philosophy who have explored in such detail and with such a wealth of ingenuity and insight the mechanisms of self-deception, the ways in which people fool themselves. It is not something altogether new with Sartre, far from it. For example, if you read Anna Karenina by Tolstoy, you may find, to your surprise perhaps, that this is one of the themes that runs all through the book. To the best of my knowledge, it's not a point that has been widely noted or that has been made in print, but I think it is one of Tolstoy's central preoccupations too, to point out how people deceive themselves. It's interesting how often the word self-deception and deceived himself and did not want to know, phrases like that, how often they occur in Anna Karenina. So I'm not trying to say this is something altogether novel in Sartre. Obviously it isn't. But I think that if you consider that some other people tried their hand before it, and some very formidable and wonderful people like Tolstoy, it's doubly remarkable that Sartre should have come up with so much that is so good on this subject. And now by way of leading into morality from there, there's of course one person who explored self-deception a little earlier than Sartre, and that is Sigmund Freud. And Sartre devotes a section of his main work, Being and Nothingness, to what he calls existential psychoanalysis. He isn't, I think, in that quite as emphatic as he might be uh, about making clear that Freud has some priority here, that Freud developed psychoanalysis, and that now Jean-Paul Sartre is trying to introduce some variations. At times it almost sounds as if it were a well-known fact that, of course, there are two kinds of psychoanalysis, Freudian and Sartrean. But there is one important difference which I think much less separates Sartre from Freud than it separates Sartre from many followers of Freud, and not only from followers of Freud, but quite especially from the large lay following that Freud enjoys, the people who have read some Freud and use him, how? Well, precisely to do what Sartre is most preoccupied with attacking, namely to deceive themselves about their freedom, to live in bad faith, to hide from themselves their freedom. I don't think that this amounts to a very fatal attack on Sigmund Freud himself. It's not a point that in this lecture I want to go into deeply. But I think that Sartre is clearly right that many people who have read Freud tend to say, as if it were obvious, well, this is the way I am, and of course it's all the fault of my governor, so all the fault of my father or my mother, the way I was brought up, and something happened to me when I was two, and that accounts for the way I am. So this is a way, according to Sartre, of self-deception, of living in bad faith, of hiding your freedom from yourself. Here, Freud himself, who went out to attack self-deception, has been quickly made into another instrument and tool of self-deception. That what I've been saying amounts in a way to suggesting, and this on purpose, that Sartre's central inspiration is moral, that Sartre's central concern is in a way that of a moralist. For all that, it is a fact that his major work ends with a promise that he will, before long, give us an ethic, and he has not so far been able to give us an ethic that satis satisfies himself. He has not worked out a book on ethics. But for all that, I think in all of his work, deeply moral concerns are implicit. And so I shall now suggest what I think are Sartre's major insights about morality. Number one, he clearly denies that there is any absolute morality. He clearly denies that there are any moral facts, facts that are simply there for us to recognize and to conform to. Another way of putting this is to say that his view of morality is anti-Platonic. 
Plato, in an important sense, believed, even if Socrates before him didn't, Plato believed that there were forms, ideas, beyond this world of justice and temperance and courage and other virtues, also a form of the good, and that it was up to us to see these forms, to have a vision of them, and if we couldn't, and most of us can't, then to listen to people who have had such a vision. In other words, according to Plato, there are, as it were, moral facts which man should realize and then conform to in his life. Many religious people look at it similarly, that there are certain things that as a matter of fact are good and evil and that man should recognize these and live accordingly. Sartre, on the other hand, denies absolute morality and suggests that morality is a matter of choice, not just a matter of choosing whether I want to be a good boy or a bad boy, but a matter of choosing moral codes, of choosing what I am to consider moral and immoral. I don't know whether this so far would strike, let us say, the majority of this particular audience as particularly radical. Very likely not. Very likely, so far, a very large percentage of modern intellectuals would not only go along, but even say, well, surely that's a commonplace. But Sartre goes further. He suggests further that there is no human nature. He says there is no human nature. Now, what does this mean? There are some people notably including some of Freud's most famous followers, who are critical of him, who have tried to develop a more or less absolute ethic, a humanistic ethic, by way of suggesting that there is a human nature, and that once you recognize what this human nature is, it becomes obvious that some things are good for it and other things are bad for it. You only have to be a doctor, that is the suggestion here, to realize that some things will ruin the patient and others will make him function properly. And this means that, after all, everything isn't so bad, everything isn't so serious, everything isn't so critical. There are certain things that are good for all men and there are other things that are bad for all men. This is a very comforting view and, I dare say, an extremely popular view. And uh, very large numbers of educated intellectual people who agree that in the old platonic or religious sense there are no absolute values assume that in this sense you can somehow reinstate a universal and up to a point absolute morality. Sartre does not agree with this. He thinks that there's no human nature for which some things are good and some bad, but that, and I quote him again, man makes himself. That man decides what is good for him and what is bad for him, and that man has to choose here. And that if he kids himself into thinking that there are certain things that just plain are good for people, or that just plain are bad for people, South would say, he engages once again in his favorite game of self-deception. He once again lives in bad faith. Now, it may, of course, be suggested, and is often suggested, by the people who use the strategy that I have just outlined, that uh, not only are there things that are good for all men and that are bad for all men, but that, of course, this isn't new at all, but that all the great religious teachers of mankind agree that they have all taught the same things, that there is a significant moral agreement, and that in this way the latest science and the oldest religions agree. Is this view right, which is so popular, or is it possible that Sarat is more profound at this point? I would side with Sarat on this. 
I do not agree that human nature being what it is, certain kinds of behavior are bound to be disastrous and to bring unhappiness. Let's say, for example, murder, theft, polygamy, dishonesty. Well, on the other hand, altruism, monogamy, and honesty are the best policy. I don't agree with that in quite that way. And, of course, this last way of putting it sounds cynical, but well, the people who put forward uh, this view bend over backwards not to be cynical. They avoid all cynicism, and they appeal not only to anthropology, sociology, above all psychology, but they also make frequent and respectful bows to mankind's greatest moral teachers. And just as there is a ready-made audience for archaeologists who claim to prove that the Bible was right, there's also a ready-made audience for social scientists who pro prove the great religious teachers right. If one engages in that sort of thing, uh, one can hardly fail, at least as far as popularity goes. But there are a number of things that are wrong with it. The first one is that the great religious teachers of mankind did not agree about morality. I won't go into any very great detail about that in this lecture. There will be opportunity if some of you want to challenge me about this in the discussion to uh, engage further in argument about this. I'll just point out that even the people who claim that the great religious teachers of mankind agree are forced very soon to uh, say that, of course, some of the so-called great religious teachers were not really great, that the, some of them were very bad. We somehow have to separate out here the good religious teachers and the bad religious teachers, at which point this particular appeal, so far as I can see, uh, breaks down completely. In that case, we might say some religious teachers agree, but others don't agree, and if the only way we have of finding out which ones are right is not by looking to them, but by examining the facts, then the appeal to authority crumbles. But when that does crumble, then I think the second fault of this strategy, which alone is crucial, meets the eye. And that is that science can present facts, but it does not establish any standards. It might conceivably show us what makes people happy and what does not. It might tell us what conditions favor a great burst of poetic creativity and what don't. What conditions make for excellence in sculpture, for great architecture, and what conditions don't? What conditions make for impressive music, and what conditions don't? Always assuming here, of course, that we can agree on what is great music, great architecture, great sculpture, and so forth, which is a moot point. One might also possibly expect that scientists can tell us what social arrangements or what kind of behavior has promoted major scientific breakthroughs. But what science cannot tell us is what goals we should choose, whether we should choose happiness or scientific breakthroughs or excellence in sculpture or in poetry or in music. Now, what, of course, is immensely popular is to tell people that they can have everything, everything and heaven too. There's no need to make any choices at all, a maximum of pleasure and of science and of art and of philosophy and of music, of morality, of comfort, of high standard of living, of religion, liberty, poetry, can all be had if we will only learn the art of loving. Or to put... <laughs> There's a biblical formulation of it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Or in modern ease, become a chewer, and all these things shall be yours as well. But to my mind, this is really a view that is the quintessence of immaturity, besides being thoroughly unscientific. One sees here the world in black and white. On the one side, there's Jesus, justice, joy, love, truth, Freud, and all the good guys. And on the other side, you get guile, gloom, guilt, tyrants, totalitarians. 
And then, in this extremely simple-minded scheme, no serious decisions have to be made anymore. It's obvious. Who is going to choose the side that has such guys as Hitler and Stalin in there? Nobody wants that. And it's suggested that all the others are on the goody gumdrop side, so we don't have to make any choices. But this isn't so. This is so for people who don't want to grow up, that they have the idea that one doesn't have to make choices, that everything is simple. It looks as if moral conduct had here been reduced simply to psychological maturity, that we don't have to grow up and face the frightening complexities of life. We are saved from all serious choices, serious quandaries, from dread responsibility. There's no need anymore for tragedy. We can have all good things without missing anything worth having. But I think Sartre, with his much more tragic view, is much more nearly right here. Take a very simple issue that could be much on our minds these days. The people who say our survival is at stake and may hinge on agreement on some absolute morality. Now what then is the standard? Should it be survival at any price? Would it be better for humanity to endure for a few more thousand years under a Hitler or in Huxley's brave new world or in some ant-like state with drastically reduced potential or on the other hand, let us say, to have a final great flowering of culture far exceeding anything yet known and then to perish nobly? I don't want to say that this is a black and white choice. It's a difficult choice, and one has to discuss it and consider it. And I think each of us must decide after painstaking reflection and discussion what he is to value ultimately. Some people say monogamy is clearly right because there are approximately equal numbers of men and women, and so it follows that this is the best arrangement. But in Germany, for example, at the end of World War II, there were ever so many more women than men. Should we then conclude that, of course, in that situation, it's all right for one man to have many wives, and in other countries, for one woman to have many husbands, but in most countries, monogamy should be the rule. Or might we not have to face the possibility, which Plato, much more radical, did face, that perhaps the whole institution of marriage might be a bad thing and perhaps under certain circumstances ought to be abolished. What I'm trying to do here is not solve these problems at all for you, but lend some substance to Sartre's suggestion that we do ultimately in morality have to make choices and that we can turn to some daddy figure who will tell us, I have studied religion or I have studied science or psychology or medicine or what have you, and I'll tell you what's good for you. No appeal to science. No appeal to expediency can settle the central moral questions which concern ultimate standards. Because what is expedient, what is good in this instrumental sense, always depends on what your goal is. And while science may tell us how various goals can or cannot be reached, it does not tell us what goals to seek. Now, the enormous question that a man like Sartre faces, after having said something of this sort, and of course much of the detail here was mine rather than his, the way of lending substance to what I take it is his view, the enormous problem that he faces is whether he is not now confronted with moral anarchy. How can he, if he says there is no such human nature, we have to choose our standards, how can he then avoid complete moral anarchy? And I think he has not found the answer to this question, though he has tried. The big question, if you want to put it differently, is how can he distinguish between a responsible choice and an irresponsible choice? Well, this is what he tried to do in his famous lecture on existentialism is a humanism, and I think that that attempt in his lecture was clearly a failure. I think it was very ill-considered. 
What he suggested, and I'll make a very long story, very short here, what he suggested is timber, the responsible choice from the irresponsible one, what he thought warranted his rebuttal of any charge of anarchy, what warranted him in saying that there was responsibility possible after all, was that nothing can be better for us unless it's better for all. And this, I think, is very clearly wrong. And I find it quite astonishing that a man as steeped in André Wied and Friedrich Nietzsche as Sartre is, should have said that nothing can be better for us unless it's better for all, seeing that as I read André Gide's novels and as I read Nietzsche's philosophy, this is their bad noir. This is the thing that they were fighting against all the time, this idea that nothing can be better for us unless it's better for all. Now what South wants to do is in this way introduce responsibility. And how it doesn't work comes out beautifully in his own example. If he says, I decide to marry, and to have children, even though this decision proceeds simply from my situation, from my passion or my desire, I am thereby committing not only myself, but humanity as a whole to the practice of monogamy. I am thus responsible for myself and for all men, and I am creating a certain image of man as I would have him to be. In fashioning myself, I fashion man. That, in a lecture, I think, is fine rhetoric, and it's a noble conclusion, but it doesn't stand up. If I marry one wife, I'm not necessarily implying that monogamy is better for all. It's not at all irrational or irresponsible to suggest that I propose to make a go of it with this one wife without having any wish whatever to limit other people who have more money or who are sexually different inclined or who find themselves in quite a different situation or environment from behaving quite differently, not marrying at all or having more than one wife. Similarly, if I choose to have two children, I needn't object to other couples having either no children at all or one or three or more. When we consider choosing a profession or writing a book, the point is even more obvious, surely. When I elect to become a philosopher, I don't imply that such a career is better for all. It's quite conceivable, although I'm not trying to make any great confession now, it's conceivable that I would prefer being a great composer or that I would prefer being a Michelangelo, but that I find that I haven't got what it takes. Now, that wouldn't mean that if therefore I become a philosopher, that I should feel that other people more fortunate than I should become philosophers too, or the other way around, that others who happen to lack whatever gifts I might have or to follow my example. Take a still more specific case, which leads it utterly to the absurd, and that is suppose that I decide to write a certain book. Now, in that case, surely, I don't want everybody to write that book. If I knew that even one other guy was writing that kind of a book, I would want to change mine. <laughs> so I think that in his attempt to meet the charge of irresponsibility, Sartre has failed. And here I will just take a swipe at somebody else, uh, being very close now to my conclusions, and we can explore that more in the discussion if you want to, I think Camus is another man who has failed at that point. Camus, too, somehow wants people to make responsible choices, thinks there is nothing that is absolutely right for everybody, but I think has been unable to give a criterion for what makes some choices better than others. This comes out very movingly in what many people consider his greatest work, La Peste, The Plague, where the central character, a doctor, takes the attitude that if a man wants to leave the town and turn his back on the rest of mankind and just seek his own happiness, well, no reason can be given why he shouldn't do that. But, on the other hand, he wishes that such a man wouldn't blame him for doing what he does. Here you have a resignation in the face of this problem. And with this I come to my conclusion.
I think that existentialism has the enormous virtue of recognizing the nature of the modern crisis, which I think other philosophers on the whole have not been doing. And further, existentialists have occasionally diagnosed this crisis exceedingly well, nor have they been defeatist about it. But when it comes to their positive prescriptions, I think it's fair to say that this has been, on the whole, their weakest part. If you turn to somebody like Kierkegaard, he suggests that we should throw reason out the window. When it comes to Sartre trying to reintroduce responsibility, he fails. But too many English-speaking philosophers have been playing ostrich, and it's a good thing to have people who face up to a crisis and diagnose it honestly, even if they don't quite know what to do about it. And here, then, is another answer to the question which I have tried to answer at the end of the first lecture and at the beginning of the second lecture, and now again at the end of the third, why one should study men with terrible views. Not because of their occasionally terrible prescriptions. Plato, too, offered some perfectly dreadful prescriptions but rather because they face up to problems and see connections that other people don't see. You might ask in the end whether I think that some of these problems can be solved, and the answer is that I have tried to solve some of these problems, particularly some of the ones that I've been talking about today, in my next book, The Faith of a Heretic, which Doubleday will publish next summer, but I don't think that this is the time for going into my own solution because my topic is existentialism and the modern crisis. <laughs>